This is from the prophet Haggai, chapter one, verses two through 20. A call to rebuild the temple. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say that the time has yet to come to rebuild, has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai, saying, is it time for you yourselves to build your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus say the Lord of hosts, consider how you have fared. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm, and that you earn wa and those that earn wages to put them into a bag of holes, bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider how you have fared. Go up to the hills and bring word wood and build the house so that I may take the pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You have looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because my house lives in, lies in ruins while all of you hurry off to your own houses. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and on the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the soil produces, on human beings and animals, and on all their labors. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Amen. I've had a lot of fun with Haggai this week. Admittedly, I did not know a whole lot about Haggai a week ago today. I have researched, and thankfully there's only two chapters to go through on Haggai, and I have really let this message speak to me and really just wrestled with it. And it has been a lot of fun. So I hope that you all get something out of this message too. Haggai is the third to last book of the Old Testament. The prophet only wrote four messages for the people. He, interestingly enough, dated his work. So we know that Haggai wrote down these messages to the people of Jerusalem in 520 BC. This was 18 years after the return from the exile in Babylon which was in 538. Now Haggai seems to indicate in the second chapter of his book that he was alive or witnessed and saw the destruction of the temple and the exile, the exile in 586 BC. So if you're doing the math, that's a 66 year difference. Knowing these dates and knowing the time, because he did thankfully date his work, we can estimate that he was at least probably six or 70 years old. If we think he had to have been probably at least six years old to witness the destruction, at least 70 years old. So now from knowing this, we can start to develop an image of who Haggai was, and as we read through his writing, we can get a sense of maybe what he was all about. I personally picture Haggai as this tall, old man, one that has a presence as he speaks, one that is very knowledgeable and full of wisdom, one that's easy to listen to. And as we read through the two chapters that he writes down that we find in the Old Testament, we learn that Haggai was very passionate and that he had a desire to see his people rise up from the ashes of exile and to reclaim their rightful place as God's light to all of the nations. Haggai's prophecy came at a time where the people of Judah were pretty vulnerable. They had been humbled by their exile in Babylon. They were very hopeful in the return to the promised land. But they had become very discouraged because people opposed them rebuilding the Jewish temple. 
And so over time, they eventually just completely gave up on it. Now, 16 years later, Haggai is receiving these messages from God. And he shares his message with the people. And he actually blames the people for the reason that they are short on clothing. The reason that their crops have not produced the way that they think that they should. And he says that the reason all of this has happened is because they've been too busy rebuilding their own lives and focusing on themselves instead of rebuilding the temple. Now, Haggai is one of the only prophets, in fact, I'm pretty certain he is the only prophet that dated his work. He gave four separate messages, and as I found this week, scholars can pretty well nail them down to the exact date. They believe that the first one was written on August 29th of 520 BC. The second one, less than a month later, on August 17th, of the same year. And then the final two were written down on the same day in what they believe was December 18th. So a couple months after that. These messages encouraged the people of Judah to finish building the temple and to have hope in the promise that God had made with them and that God would bless their future. After thousands of years, this book remains largely unique for one key reason. The people actually listened. <laughs> Haggai's message to rebuild the temple was passionate, it was simple, it was straightforward, and nobody could mistake whether or not the direction had been followed because the temple did end up get rebuilt and there was evidence for the people to see that this had happened. And it was through the physical act of rebuilding their temple that the people began to indicate a shift in their spiritual lives. They went from a, de a devotion of themselves to a devotion of God. Now I'm guessing that most of us have probably not ever read the two chapters of Haggai. Or if we have, it's one that we're not real familiar with and one that we don't read often. So I am going to briefly summarize and highlight a few of the key points from these verses. Haggai starts out giving his date, and usually when we read through these names and everything, we skip them and think they're not important, but they are very important because they really do date the history of this. And Haggai begins with telling the people you procrastinated. For 16 years, you procrastinated. God said that it was time, and you said it wasn't. And so now God has spoke to me, and I have a message for you. And this is what God spoke through Haggai. He says, how is it that it is the right time in your lives for you to live in your fine new homes, these homes that you have built while God's temple remains in ruins. He says a little bit later that God spoke to him again and told the people to take a good hard look at your life. Think it over. You have spent a lot of money, yet you have nothing to show for it. You keep filling your plates, but you personally never get filled up. You drink and drink and drink yet you are continuously thirsty. You put on layer after layer of warm clothes, but you can't get warm. And those people who work for you, what are they getting out of it? Nothing. Just a leaky, rusty bucket. That's it. So take a good hard look at your life and think it over. Haggai then goes on to say, while you all have been running around and been caught up with your own lives, with building your own house, the Lord has pointed out again that his house is in ruins. And the reason why is because of all of your stinginess. And because you are being stingy to the Lord, 
Nobody, no man, no woman, no animal or crop is going to thrive. Then Haggai gives them a message of hope and said, God has told me to tell you that I am with you. When Haggai shared these words from God of I am with you, reminding them that God is still with them, even though they haven't been focused on God, it says that the people got up and began moving, got busy. Haggai goes on and he says, yes, get to work, all of you. Remember, God is with you. This is where that third message of Haggai begins. If you remember when I told you the dates, it took them two months for him to share these words. So they got up and started moving, but not really ambitiously. Two months later, he says, put into action those words that God coveted with you when you left Egypt. God is living and breathing among all of you right now. Don't be timid and don't hold back. He says this temple that you are going to build is going to end up far better than it started out. It had a glorious beginning, but it will have an even more glorious finish. A place in which I will hand out wholeness and holiness. Haggai then gives them a fourth message. One that I feel like is a big wake-up call for all of them. He says, go ahead and go consult the priests on what I am about to tell you. If someone carries a piece of sacred meat in their pocket, a meat that is set apart for sacrifice on the altar, and then as they're going along, that pocket touches a loaf of bread, a dish of stew, a bottle of wine or oil or any other food, Will those food that it touches be made holy? So they consulted with the priest, and the priest said no. But then Haggai says, okay, if one of you as a person goes and touches and is contaminated by a corpse, and then you go out and you touch any of these foods, will those foods be contaminated? And the priests say yes. So Haggai says, this is how it is with God. You need to quit dragging your feet and your half-hearted efforts of rebuilding the temple, and you need to get busy. Get very busy. Don't continue to ignore God. And then he says to them, think ahead of a future date. From now on, as you go towards that date, you will be able to count your blessings. He says that the Lord says to all of you, I'm about to shake up everything and turn it upside down and you will start over from top to bottom and I will take care of you. I have called all of you and I have looked over the field and chosen you, each of you, for this work. Haggai has an amazing message in these two short little chapters. Though this is really focused on the Jewish temple, I think that it is so relevant to our lives today. One of the key elements that I love about Haggai is that he remembers the church and what it was like in its glory days. The temple from that previous time period. And I think that that's something that all of us can relate to. If I were to stand here and ask you to reflect back on the time that you would identify that this church was best living out its mission and its call, what did the glory days of this church look like? What were the ministries of this church? You were probably thinking of the pastor who was appointed here at that time as well. You can remember it vividly, and that's what Haggai was doing in this reflection. In our own lives, this is also a common thought and a common reflection for most churches in today's world. Not just United Methodist churches, but churches all around the world are realizing that church is not what it once was. And most of us would probably take that a little bit farther and say church is not what it should be or what it could be. How do we measure 
the success of a church? How do we measure whether or not a church is living in true glory? Is it by the number of people that fill up the pews on a Sunday morning or whether or not our church is all mostly under the age of 50 with young children running around and lots of ministries going on? Is that what measures the success of a church? Most of us would say no, because we are accustomed to measuring success by data points, by gathering evidence, something that is truly measurable, to say, yes, this is what makes it successful. Our conference asks us to report these numbers every single year. We call it our church vitality. But I would push back a little bit and say, while those numbers are certainly important, you cannot have a church with, I believe the Bible says, two or three are gathered in my name, but we like to see more than two or three, of course, in a church. Numbers are important, and those data points are important, but I would push back and say that's not what measures the success of a church. The success of a church, to me, is not measured by quantity or the numbers but it is measured by the quality of the people who come. I'm not saying that this doesn't mean that our church has to be full of perfect people who have already met Christian perfection, but what I am saying is that the people who come, the people who want to be a part of any church, should continue to grow deeper and deeper in their faith. The depth of their spirituality should grow so much deeper. When we show up to worship, we should make sure that we are allowing ourselves to be changed, not just going through the motions. We should be allowing the Spirit to work within us. That leads me to a second key element that I take away from Haggai. But before I get to that, I would like to share with you a quote from Richard Rohr. If you don't know who Richard Rohr is, he was ordained in the Roman Catholic Church in 1970. And then he has gone on to become a Franciscan priest. And he founded the CAC, which is the Center of Action and Contemplation. Richard Rohr has written many, many books. He is an amazing author. He is an amazing speaker. I really, really enjoy his work. The quote that has really stuck out to me, though, says, Religion is one of the safest places to hide from God. Religion is one of the safest places to hide from God. That has spoke to me on such a deep level over this past week. As I read through the words of Haggai, I'm going to remind you of those. Haggai says, take a good, hard look at your life and think it over. You spend a lot of money, but you don't have anything to show for it. You keep filling your plates, but you never get filled up. You keep drinking and drinking and drinking, yet you continue to thirst. And you put on layer and layer of clothing yet you are never warm. And these people who work for you, what are they getting out of it? Not much. Just a leaky, rusted out bucket. That's what. If we each truly take a deep, hard look at our own lives, we might find that in many ways we are appearing to do the right things in our lives according to the standards of religion. This religious standard that has been set by denominations. We go to church regularly, or at least regularly enough for our own personal standards. Yet we are not always living our lives in the ways that are true to our gospel teachings. We are told to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, not come to church so that we can check the attendance box and say that we were here as part of a religious institution. We do all the things that we are supposed to do to be good Christian people according to religious standards. 
We fill up our offering plate every week. We come here in our best dressed. We sing the songs. We come forward. We receive the juice and the bread for communion. It's all just part of our tradition, part of what we do. We shake each other's hands. We give to the outside ministries of our church when we are asked. We join leadership's board because we're called on and said, hey, we need somebody to do this. And we show up for those meetings. But are we really living our lives in the way that we are called? Or is it just part of what we were taught that we are to do in the tradition of a religious denomination? We might even leave here on Sunday mornings and go out and talk about it with our friends or with our neighbors or with the people who we have coffee with throughout the week. But are we just telling them how involved we are with the church to let them know that we do these things? Or are we telling them because we're sharing the gospel message? Because we're sharing love? There is a big difference. For some, these are simply actions, traditions, that are set forth by religion on what we are supposed to do. But in both the Old Testament, in ways like we're reminded from Haggai today, and of course in the New Testament through the Gospels and through the letters of Paul, through all of those teachings, we are reminded over and over and over again that these things or these actions going through the motions is not enough. We have to be willing to do better. We're not called to get together and judge another person to assume that they should feel this way or that they're living their lives this way or that they should be living their lives this way or maybe this would work better for them because we think that's what we would want if we were in their shoes. We're not called to gossip about anyone or to judge anyone. To think that young families need to be in worship because that's the way it always happened. We aren't called to assume that somebody else finds God or hears the word of God in the same ways that we do. We are called to understand that we are all different. That we all connect with the spirit different. And that through the spirit and through God, we are able to connect with each other when it's for the right reasons. As I've thought about this this week, I've thought about the ways that sometimes we do judge the other. The ways that sometimes we think that we have built this perfect church, these perfect ministries, we've built our perfect ways, our perfect actions. And then we talk about others and think, well, they're not coming because of this or because of that. We reflect our own emotions and assume that they feel that way. And I've thought about this from my own standpoint as a mom. I am a big believer that we are all made in the image of God. And so I think that if God sees or hears, because I do believe that God is omnipotent and has the ability to see and hear all of our conversations or even our thoughts. If God is to see or hear us or watch us thinking these things about somebody else, how does that make God feel? I know for me, when somebody talks about my kids or my spouse, these people who I love unconditionally, it sparks that familiar term that we're familiar with in Montana, that mama bear instinct. And I think if I feel that way, God must feel that way too. When somebody is criticizing or talking or gossiping about his children. God has a natural need to try to protect us and to love us through it. To nurture us and to guide us and to remind us that I am with you. You're not alone. We are not called to just go through the motions. When we show up to act out the traditions of our church and then to go home, we are called to truly give ourselves in all ways, in every single way. 
When we show up here on a Sunday morning or we join online in our living room or wherever we are watching the scripture and sermon from, we are called to show up with the desire to seek the Holy Spirit. And when we go through the motions of these traditions, when we pray together and join in our call to worship and have communion and the offering, and we join together in singing, when we share our joys and concerns, these are not just set up as a way that if you do all these things and check these boxes, you will get closer to Christ. These are set up in ways that if we allow ourselves, the Spirit will work in and through those ways to work within us. And sometimes that doesn't happen from being here in this sanctuary or in any sanctuary. Sometimes that happens outside when we are doing works for our community, when we are in conversation with others, when we are outside here on our church lawn edging it after 20 years. If we allow God to work within us and we show up in a way that we're not just going through the motions, we will be changed. And when we go out, when we leave this place and we go home, we are not called to just go join our coffee group and go right back into our old ways and into our old routines. We are called to leave here with the Spirit of God making our hearts feel strangely warm. And then we are supposed to go out and allow that Spirit to continue working within us in a way that helps us to reform our life, to reshape who we are in growing closer and closer to Christ. We are called to be more like God day after day. As I mentioned earlier in those final verses of Haggai, Haggai reminds us that God is with you. God is with you. And Haggai reminds us that we are called to rebuild our temple. In some ways, that might be rebuilding the temple that is us, our own selves, to allow the ways that we participate in the community of faith that we are a part of to be transformed. Through the physical act of rebuilding the temple, the people that Haggai prophesied to began to indicate a shift in their own spiritual lives as they shifted away from devotion from their self to devotion of God. And I believe that when we allow that change to happen, the same will happen for us. When you give up devotion to yourself you, and you work toward the devotion of God, you will not only see yourself transformed in a life in a way that begins to start living a life that is full of glory. But the church in itself will be transformed. The spiritual depth of this church, the ways to measure success, if we want to term it that way, will be transformed. The church will be revived into a time that is better than its glory days. God is with you. Amen. Our hymn of reflection this morning is Be Thou My Vision.